Anyway. All right, so I'm being stretched. This is, might be all for me tonight. But let's, if you can turn to Genesis chapter 23, we're going to walk through here. Father, we just come before you. You may have to shut that down. And uh, we just ask that your spirit would be here tonight. I pray that you'd speak through me, Lord. I have absolutely nothing on, on my mind to say. I'm going to be real honest. I'm going to ask your Holy Spirit to speak through me. Let revelation come. Father, I pray if there's someone in here that, that needs to hear a word, I pray that they would hear it and that you would speak through your word because that's what you do best. You don't need a voice to speak for you. You do very well on your own. But Father, I'm just going to open my mouth tonight and read your word, and I pray that you would reveal uh, your mysteries to us. Amen. Okay, Sarah. This is the, about the death of Sarah. Sarah is, of course, the wife of Abram, Abraham. Sarah lived to be 127 years old. She died at Kiriath Arba, that is in Hebron, uh, in, in the land of Canaan. And Abraham went to mourn for Sarah and to weep over her. Then Abram rose from beside his dead wife and spoke to the Hittites. He said, I'm an alien and a stranger. You realize what that means, don't you? That means he was a Gentile. Abraham was a Gentile before he became a Hebrew. I am an alien and a stranger among you. Sell me some property for a burial site so I can bury my wife. The Hittites replied to Abraham, Sir, listen to us. You are a mighty prince among us. Bury your dead in the choicest of our tombs. None of us will refuse you his tomb for burying your dead. That Abraham rose and bowed down before the people of the land, the Hittites. And he said to them, If you are willing to let me bury my dead, then listen to me and intercede with Ephron, son of Zohar, on my behalf. So he will sell me the cave of Machpelah, Machpelah which belongs to him, and it's at the end of his field. Ask him to sell it to me for the full price as a burial site among you. So you understand what's going on here is you have a field, the Hittites have a field, and Abraham has an unbelievable reputation. And so much reputation that, that he just says, listen, I would like to bury my wife. And they say, we give you the choicest of our tombs. What does he say? Abraham says, no, 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 you don't understand. Your choicest of tombs is not remotely good enough for my wife. I want you to sell me that cave which belongs to him at the end of this field. I want that for my wife. I don't want your tombs that you've already done and all of the, the wonders of all the people that are in the Hittite land. I want that field and I want to buy that field and I want my wife to be buried in that field. This is going to be good. By the way, remember every single story you find in the Bible is there for a reason. This is a significant story that is in the Bible. This is a very prophetic story that is going to be talking about you. So as we go through this, and we're going to come back through this, I want you to recognize that Abraham is what? The father? He represents Father Yahweh. That's what called Father Abraham. Had many sons, right? He represents Father Yahweh. His son represents who? Did we get it back? Thank you. Matt, you're hired. <laughs> Matt has just joined us uh, on staff at PFT, and we are happy to have him. Can, can we just get, stop and give him a round of applause for everything that he does? Without him, I would be completely. And all these guys are amazing. Okay, what verse am I on? <laughs> Story of my life. All right, verse 10. I don't know why. A computer is like my binky. Anybody ever feel like that? If you don't have a computer, you're just like without your blanket or something. Ephron dwelt among the Hittites, and Hiphron, the Hittite, and the Hittites, and in the presence of all that went in the gate of the city. I can't read everything on here, but that's okay. Let's do this so I can read everything. There we go. And Abraham, in the presence of the Hittites, and in the presence of all that went into the gate of the city, saying, No, my Lord, listen to me. I will give you the field and the cave which is in it. I will give it to you. In the presence of my people, I give it to you. Bury your dead. This is a very interesting conversation. Listen up. And Abraham bowed down before the people of the land. 
Then he said to Ephron in the presence of the people of the land, if you are willing, then hearken to me. I will give you money for the price of the field. Take it from me and I will bury my dead. Now listen, this is a bizarre conversation. It's like, uh, you know, you have a, uh, a piece of property and uh, you want to, uh, and, and, and someone comes along and offers you money for the field. And the other person that has the field says, no, I want you to have the field. I want you to take the field. And Abraham is refusing a very expensive piece of property. Remember, this is the choicest property, this field, this cave. He wants to buy this. He does not want it to be sold. The reason why this is so significant, folks, is because, number one, Abraham is a very smart guy. And he knows that if the, if the enemy in the future, gives him this field, what happens? Abraham owes him, and he can take it back because legally that field is, belongs to Ephron, and if he gives it to him, that's leverage, you see? It's kind of like if I borrow something from you. I mean, if I borrow something very important from you, guess what? I owe it back to you. You have leverage over me, if I don't return it, or if I, even if you give it to me, how many realize, I'm not saying this right, but if somebody donates a, a million dollars to a ministry, do they normally donate it and just say, here's a million bucks, use it for whatever you want? No. Almost in every church in America, it's sad to say, but I know this to be true on a large extent, that the largest donators in the ministry or in the church typically are in either in leadership or have some sort of leverage in the ministry to make decisions. They want their hand in the cookie jar. It's not enough just to be obedient and to donate. We have been blessed enough that we have had people that, believe it or not, give and not expect anything in return. Where are all those people? And see, Abraham knows this because human nature goes all the way back to Adam and Eve. He knows that if he, does, if he does not buy this field, that these folks will have leverage over him. So now they got this interesting conversation going on. It's so prophetic. I'll tell you why in just a minute. Verse 15, I believe, is where we're at. Verse 16. And Abraham hearkened unto Ephraim, and Abraham weighed to Ephraim the sum of money which he named in the presence of the Hittites, 400 shekels of silver, legal tender, with the merchants. Thus the field of Ephron, which was by the side of the double cave, the double cave, which was before Mamre, that is, the field of the cave, and the cave which was in it, and all the trees that were in the field that were on its borders round about, that were made sure and sold to Abraham in the presence of the Hittites, and in the presence of all that went into the gates of the city. And let's just take a, a second here and check something. Interesting. And unto Abraham for a possession in the presence of the children of Heth. That's the Hittites, okay? And Heth, unbelievable. This is not a surprise to me. But Heth is an aborigine. Heth is a Nephilim. Okay? These are children of the Nephilim. If you are here for the teaching on the Nephilim, you... Uh, you, you may have recalled the story that the Nephilim or the, the children that came from the sons of God that uh, mated with the daughters of men. The fallen angels that mated with the daughters of men created giants in the land, or what they called where we get the term holy terror from. Uh, that's what, where this is coming from, is that these were holy terrors in the land. Not all of them were mean, but eventually uh, they became uh, so overbearing and overpowerful that uh, they began to eat everything on planet Earth, literally. Everything, they began to eat everything, and, and the next thing to eat was human beings. And they became, literally overpowered all of these cities and all of these towns. They were the terrors. Not every single one of them. I'd imagine that, that just like Heth here, the Hittites, maybe they had calmed down and, and, become, uh, and they began to intermarry with, with women again. And so the giants began to lose some of their stature. Samson, or excuse me, uh, 
uh, David and Goliath. Goliath and his four other brothers, they were Nephilim. They were part of that Nephilim uh, tribe. And so these were a tribal aborigines. They were called terrors that lived in the, some of the original Canaanites that lived in the land of Canaan. And Abraham does not want to cut a deal with them. These are the people that are not holy. They are not following God. And they are children of those that were fallen angels. Okay? And you can look that up if, later if you don't believe me. But in any case, that becomes important. If I can get back to what I was reading. That becomes important because let's just, I'm just going to give you the prophetic part of this, what I'm seeing here, so that as we walk through here, you can completely join in with, with the, the power of, of God's Word. Like I said in the very beginning, everything is prophetic in the Scriptures. And the story of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and Sarah is far more prophetic than, than you may even realize. Matter of fact, Sarah represents who? Anybody have a guess? Sarah represents us because we are the bride, are we not? What is a field in Scripture? What do trees represent in Scripture? Anybody know? People, that's right. Trees in Scripture uh, will more often than times dictate people. What are, what's a field normally represented of? No? A field is people as well. Okay, you have different, uh, different word pictures uh, for people, and a field is people, trees are people, and what, what's happening here, and, and actually, field can be Torah as well, it can be covenant-based as well, but it, the, the covenant's always with people, so you have the field, the covenant-based, with people, the trees, and you have this cave on a field, and then you have his wife that's dead, and you, and you have uh, people that, a field that needs redeemed. And so what you have here is the most incredible love story, the first incredible love story in the Bible. There's only two absolutely unbelievable love stories in all the Bible that trump all love stories, and that is the Abraham and Sarah story, and that is uh, Messiah and his bride, and they're both the same story. You see, have we not need redemption? God's people need a redemption. Why? Because the northern kingdom, which is the bride of Messiah, along with the southern kingdom, but the northern kingdom was divorced. And in need of unbelievable redemption. Why? Because the Torah said that if you divorce your wife, there's no way that you can remarry her. Once you divorce your wife, it's over. You cannot marry her back. Matter of fact, if she marries someone else while, while your, her previous husband is still alive, she's called an adulteress. The only way that she's allowed to remarry anyone is if her original husband dies. Once her original husband dies, she is free to remarry. So catch the incredible word picture because you have Yeshua who divorces his northern kingdom bride. There's no way that she can ever come back, but at the same time, he puts out a call and says, if you do come back, I'll remarry you, which is against the Torah, which is why Yahweh had to send his son, the bridegroom, to die. Once the bridegroom dies, it frees the northern kingdom, his bride, from the law of adultery, and she's now free, according to the law, of the Torah, the covenant, to marry another. Yeshua rises from the grave and offers his hands wide open to marry his bride. But that pattern is seen all the way back here in the book of Genesis with Abraham and Sarah. Because at the same time, Sarah needed a burial place. And the field, the place that Father has chosen, the land, to put his bride had to be redeemed. The only way to redeem it was to buy it, to purchase it. And that's what Yeshua did for us. He purchased the field. He purchased us with his blood. And so you'll see as we walk through here that there's a lot of parallelisms here and a lot of, pro of prophetic uh, symbolism. He did not want to cut a deal with the enemy. And it's interesting that the Hittites here have a blood that's a DNA that's not pure. It's not completely of this earth. The enemy, of course, is a spiritual realm, and he didn't want to cut a deal with him either. He purchased us with his blood. And after this, Abraham buried, in verse 19, Sarah, his wife, in the double cave, which is in the field before Mamre. The same is Hebron in the land of Canaan. Thus the field and the cave that was in it were deeded to Abraham 
for a possession of a burial ground by the Hittites. Verse 24, now Abraham was old and well and advanced in years, and Yahweh had blessed him in all things. And Abraham called his eldest servant, the steward of his house, who was in charge of everything that he had. And he said to him, put your hand under my girdle, and I will make you, right about here, I will make you swear by the Lord, the God of heaven and the God of earth, that you shall not take to my son a wife of the daughters of the Canaanites among whom I dwell, but that you will go to my country and to my kindred and take a wife for my son Isaac. Now who's Isaac represent? Yeshua. Abraham's the father. Isaac represents Yeshua. How do we know that? Because Abraham went to, to offer Isaac, sacrifice Isaac, and what happened? It's a complete 100% picture of the death uh, of, of Yeshua. So catch this as we walk through here, but you go to my country, my kindred, and you take a wife from my son, Isaac, from my family. Promise me that you will not take a wife for my son, Yeshua, from the world. His bride must come from my family. That's going to be very important for our theological discussion that we might have a little bit later. And the servant said to him, Suppose the woman will not be willing to follow me to this land. Must I then take your son back to the land from whence you came? Where is Yeshua going to? He's coming back to the land from which his father took him. And he's going to take his bride there. But his bride is not with Isaac. His bride is somewhere else in the world, part of his family. Unknown to Isaac at this time. And the servant, which represents the Holy Spirit here, says, what if the bride doesn't come? I'm going to go, Holy Spirit, and I'm going to call out to your people, I'm going to call out to your bride, and I'm going to tell them that they need to come back to the land. Come back to the Father, come back to the Messiah. You are a bride. You are not supposed to be living with the family. You are not the family. You are the bride. Come out of her, my people. How many times have we heard that? And he says, what if she doesn't come? What if she doesn't want to come? What if she doesn't recognize the significance of who you are and who your son is to be your bride? What if she's just content with being a family member? And Abraham said to him, Beware, whoops, beware that you do not take my son thither. You know, that's not a very good version. Don't take her back there. Beware that you do not take my son back there. Then Yahweh Elohim of heaven, who took me from my father's house and from the land of my family, and who spoke to me and swore to me, saying, to your descendants I give this land. He will send his angel before you that you shall take a wife for my son, From, from there. And if the woman is not willing to follow you, then you will be released from this oath. Only do not take my son back there. So the servant put his hand under the thigh of Abraham, which is, by the way, a symbol of authority. It would have been his right thigh. Which is why when Jacob was wrestling with the angel, what did the angel touch? His right thigh and caused him to limp. Because Jacob was a man of full 100% in charge of his own life. He had his own authority. He was doing things his way. He was an authority unto himself. And Yahweh stripped him of his authority. So that he would always remember everywhere that he walked that he was a man now under authority. He was not his own authority. He was bought with a price. Which to this day, there are Native American tribes in the United States of America that do not eat the hip of the deer in remembrance of Jacob's hip being put out of place by the angel because the Native Americans, as uh, uh, archaeology and science has discovered, are from the Israelites. They are Hebrews. And uh, some of them are actually from the tribe of Judah. 
And if you don't know this, I, I did a teaching on this uh, a while back, uh, added this in there, but I'm a 16th Cherokee. And in Tennessee, they have the, the uh, nation's largest Cherokee museum. They have a 700-foot cave wall, and guess what's written on it? Their language, which was ancient Paleo-Hebrew. Okay? They had a Jubilee stone and the whole nine yards. You can look it up online. It's incredible. Israelites are everywhere. Matter of fact, I sat next to a guy a couple years ago at a conference, and he was the super great-grandson of... Um, I just had it in my brain, a real p chief sitting bull. He was a super great grandson of sitting bull, and he discovered that he was a Hebrew. He couldn't believe it, and he, and he did all this research online. He left uh, the South Dakota where his tribe was, and he was traveling a little bit, and he did all this research and found out, oh my goodness, I'm actually a Hebrew. I'm actually an Israelite, and, and, and all these things of what his tribe did made perfect sense, the whole rain dance and and just how the, every thing that they did could be traced back virtually to something that was found in the Hebrew Scriptures or the Hebrew way of life. And so he decided to go back after doing all this research and sit in front of Chief Sitting Bull, or his chief at the time, I guess. The, and uh, and he, he was so excited, and he said, Chief, look at all the stuff that I have found. You know, and he laid out his whole case, and the chief was sitting there the whole time just listening. Wow, you know, that's interesting. That's interesting. At the very end, you know, uh, this, this gentleman, his name is David, he said, he said, Chief, what do you think? And the chief said, tell me something I do not already know. They already know these things. So the servant put his hand under the thigh of Abraham, his master, and swore to him concerning this matter. Then the servant took ten of his master's camels. Do you think that was a coincidence that he chose ten? How many tribes are in the northern kingdom? Ten. He chose ten tribes, ten servants of his master's camels and departed. For all his master's goods were in his hand. And he arose and went to Mesopotamia to the city of Nahor. Okay, sorry about that. Every once in a while I look something up. And he made his camels kneel down outside the city by a well of water at evening time. The time when women go out to draw water. Then he said, O Lord God of my master Abraham, please give me success this day and show kindness to my master Abraham. He's sweating bullets is what he's doing. He's on a mission. Behold, here I stand by the well of water, and the daughters of the men of the city are coming out whoops, to draw water. Now let it be that a young woman to whom I say, please down your pitcher that I may drink, and she says, drink, and I will also give your camels a drink, let her be the one you have appointed for your servant Isaac. And by this, I will know that you have shown kindness to my master. Now, I would imagine that this, you know, not to take anything away from the power in, the, in, the, in, the, in this prayer that this gentleman is, is giving, but I would imagine because God uses very natural things in life, that this was probably a, a pretty common thing that happened, uh, and that, that this happened where somebody would say something like this and, and, a, and a young lady would say this, but it was the first one, the first one that says this is going to be the one that he is going to choose and it happened before he had finished speaking that behold, Rebekah, who was born to Bethuel, son of Milcah, the wife of Naor, Abraham's brother, came out with her pitcher on her shoulder. Now the young woman was very beautiful to behold, a virgin. No man had ever known her, and she went down to the well and filled her pitcher and came up. Okay, I got my first revelation. If you turn over to the book of Revelation, and I, and, and I know that Steve will probably be able to tell me what chapter this is in. I think it's in chapter 12. One of the requirements of the 144,000 is that they are to never have known a woman. They were to be chaste and not adulterers. And I believe there's a connection here because remember, this is the bride of Messiah. She cannot have known another woman, meaning that she, had, she cannot have ever given herself 
to another. What does this mean? What am I trying to say? This means that the bride of Messiah is chaste. It absolutely knows who it's, her spouse is, and she is dedicated and faithful to him. Detail that for me, Jim. What that looks like is this. The bride of Messiah doesn't say, well, I'm going to do this. Well, you know, I'm going to do it over here. Maybe, you know, well, I'm going to do this. I promise I'm going to serve you. I'm going to do the best I can. The bride of Messiah doesn't do the best that she can. The bride of Messiah serves her husband all the time. She's faithful. I'm not saying that she's perfect, but she's faithful. She's dedicated. She's surrendered. She doesn't waver. She doesn't flip-flop. She's not a pancake. She drinks from his well and only his well, and she's willing to serve him regardless of whether she understands anything or not. Listen, she's willing to serve 10 camels, all the servants, by herself. And she doesn't even know this gentleman. That's the kind of bride the Messiah has. Today we've created a bride that tries God out. We've created a bride that tries out things. Even with Torah, what do we have? We have people that are coming into the knowledge and understanding of the Torah, and they try it out. Where is it in Scripture that you covenant with someone, and you get to try? Walk down at the end of the aisle on your wedding day and, and say, to you, I give my life. I'm going to do my best and see how it works. I'm going to try. If it doesn't work out, that's what the prenuptial agreement's for. That's not what it's for. You see, because here's what God's looking for. What Yahweh's looking for is 100% pure heart. Does that mean you get in and you do all of his commandments? No. It means you're willing to do whatever he opens your heart to do at that moment, and you don't turn around. You don't ever stop trying. When he opens your eyes on something, and, and you get it, you get it, and you go. You don't get it and then go, in other words, let me give you an example. You're 100% convinced that I need to keep the Sabbath. I'm just going to throw out the fourth commandment. I could start at number one, but let's skip to number four. I'm 100% convinced we need to keep the Sabbath. Bah, but it's okay to break it today. Eh, today's, you know, once a month. Hey, three out of four weeks? Yeah, that's not bad. That is not a bride of Messiah. That's like saying, you know what, I mean, I, you know, honey, I was faithful to you, you know, 10 out of 11 years. Try telling your wife that you love her and then, you know, go be with someone else. It's only one night. 364 out of 365 is not bad. That's a pretty good percentage. That's an A plus in school. But see, he doesn't grade on a curve. Jim, you're being harsh. No, I'm being realistic of what your husband and what your spouse requires from you. Why is it that we give God less? Your spouse requires 100% faithfulness all the time. Do you not? Not to say that we're all perfect, but what I'm saying is the expectation is that's what we're supposed to be. The scriptures say be holy. Why? Because you are holy. You are set apart. Jim, I don't feel holy. You are set apart. doesn't mean you're perfect. It means that you are like fine china. You are created for this purpose to be holy. That's why he says, so be it. You're already created set apart. Once you accepted me, you, I set you apart from all peoples. Now act like it. Give me everything that you are, everything that I'm putting inside of you. I cannot bless you until you give me your all. There's no such thing. It's like, it's like honestly, that's the best example I can tell off the top of my head. It's like buying a lottery ticket, and I don't recommend it, but buying a lottery ticket, and it's got four scratch-offs, right? You've got to match the little prize in the middle, and you scratch off three. <laughs> what? I mean, either you're going to scratch all of them off, or you're not going to scratch off any of them. This is the scripture in Revelation 3.16 where it says, well, you know, I'd rather you be what? Hot or cold, but if you're lukewarm, I will spit you out of my mouth. At some point, ladies and gentlemen, I'm talking to everyone online in the sound of my voice, we have got to get serious about God. 
We've got to be, at some point, we're going to put both feet in and say, you know what? I'm going to own up for the mistakes I've made. I'm going to absolutely put on a bulletproof vest, and I'm going to gird up my, I'm going to do what the Bible says. I'm going to put a belt on for once so that my pants don't keep falling down. I'm going to take the sword, and I'm going to fight the enemy. He's not looking for people to come to church on Sunday. He wants you to come to church on Saturday. All right. I'm surprised my wife hasn't texted me. Jim, slow down. Oh, she can't hear me. She's in the children's ministry today. It's not streaming yet down there. What verse am I on? Yes. So we have a beautiful virgin comes out. No man had known her. She's a perfect bride. She went to the well, filled her pitcher, and came up. What does she have, by the way? What's in her pitcher? Pure water. Not mixed with anything. The bridegroom is thirsty. And the servant ran to meet her and said, Please let me drink a little water from your pitcher. So she said, Drink, my Lord. Then she quickly let her pitcher down to her hand and gave him a drink. When she finished giving him a drink, she said, I will draw water for your camels also until they have finished drinking. This is one heck of a woman. Gift of hospitality. Then she quickly emptied her pitcher into the trough, ran back to the well to draw water, and drew for all of his camels. Now, the strange thing is, is he lets her do this. That's, that's what I don't quite understand, is he lets her do this. Uh, but it, it must be part of the custom, and, and he's probably uh, enamored at her beauty and, and amazed that his prophecy is coming true right before his very eyes. And the man wondering at her remained silent so as to know whether Yahweh had made his journey prosperous or not. Are you kidding me? He's answering your, your, your prayer before you were even done praying. So it was when the camel finished drinking that the man took a golden nose ring weighing half a shekel and two bracelets for her wrist, weighing 10 shekels of gold. Now, I know whatever beautiful woman that you had in, in the back of your mind, you j- just ruined it with the whole nose ring thing, right? That, that's, I was, I bet you never thought of Abraham's wife that way before, okay? So the next time you see someone with a nose ring, they're just biblical, okay? Don't get, don't get down on them for all the nose rings and everything. They fit right into biblical times. That was a joke. No emails, please. Half a shekel nose ring, that's a pretty good one, and said, whose daughter are you? Tell me, please. Is there room in your father's house for us to lodge? Of course, my father has lots of mansions, many rooms in his house. So she said to him, I am the daughter of Bethuel, Milka's son, whom she bore to Naor. Moreover, she said to him, We have both straw and feed enough and room to lodge. Then the man bowed down his head and worshipped Yahweh. He gets to keep his job. And he said, Blessed to Yahweh, God of my master Abraham, who has not forsaken his mercy and his truth toward my master. As for me being on the way, the Lord led me to the house of my master's brethren. So the young woman ran and told her mother's household these things. Now Rebekah had a brother whose name was Laban, and Laban ran out to the man by the well. So it came to pass when he saw the nose ring and the bracelets on his sister's wrist, and when he heard the words of his sister Rebekah saying, Thus the man spoke to me, that he went to the man, and there he stood by the camels at at the well. And he said, Come in, O blessed of Yahweh. Why do you stand outside? For I have prepared the house and and a place for the camels. Then the man came to the house, and he unloaded the camels, provided straw and feed for the camels, and water to wash his feet, and the feet of the men who were with him. Food was set before him to eat, but he said, I will not eat until I have told you about my errand. And he said, speak on. Now you understand, the nose ring and the bracelets, that's an, that's an engagement issue going on there. And so those, those are the engagement rings. Hannah, you just got married. Are you so glad that Josh didn't have to fit you for a nose ring, right? So verse 34, he says, I am Abraham's servant. 
Didn't you have to even tell anybody. Everybody knows Abraham. The Lord has blessed my master greatly, and he has become great. He has given him flocks and herds and silver and gold and male and female servants and camels and donkeys, and lions and tigers and bears. And Sarah, my master's wife, bore a son to my master when she was old. And to him he, was, he has given all that he has. Now my master made me swear, saying, You shall not take a wife for my son from the daughters of the Canaanites, in whose land I dwell. By the way, let's take a, just a, a, a quick rabbit trail here back to the Nephilim thing. The, the significance about not taking a wife from the land of the Canaanites is because the Canaanite women could or could not have the DNA of a real human being. Let's face it, I know it sounds strange and I know it sounds fantastic, but the reality is from the day one when Adam sinned, what was the curse on the serpent? The curse on the serpent is that the, somewhere down the line, out of the lineage of a woman, that son would bruise your head, would crush your head. So if someone, if you were the enemy on that day in the garden, and you heard the creator of the universe say, hey, by the way, because you've deceived Eve, Hava, life, I am, going to, I am going to curse you that one of her children somewhere down the line is going to crush your head. What would you do? Do whatever it took to destroy the lineage of that human being. Why? Because if you did that, that you erase the possibility of that Messiah ever coming to earth. It would be physically, DNA, scientifically impossible. What are, what, what's mankind doing today? What, messing around with the DNA. If you mess with the DNA, you are messing with life that God created. The very thing that was happening in the days of Noah. How interesting. Because the Bible says at the end of time before the Messiah comes back, it's going to be as in the days of Noah. Do not take a wife from the land of the Canaanites, from the people that are living in the land of Canaan. It must be pure, and it must be from my house. And I think that's incredibly interesting, because when we get down to it, when we get to the New Testament, we find, when we go to the, 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 uh, the parable of the wedding feast, what do we have in the parable of the wedding feast? Let's read it. Let's go there real quick. Anybody know where it's at? I do. Matthew chapter 22. <laughs> Thank the Lord for computers. If you have your Bibles, which you should, Matthew chapter 22. Parallel the wedding feast. Let's just read it, because this is going to be a parable and a parallel. The marriage of the king's son. Sound familiar? Okay, that's a little bizarre there. I just was starting to go, that just doesn't sound like Matthew 22. That's how prophetic it is. It shows up in, in Matthew. And Jesus, and Yeshua answered and spoke to them again by parables and said, the kingdom of heaven. What's the kingdom of heaven, by the way? Whole sermon could be given on this. Somebody yell it out. We're in big trouble because we're supposed to seek it first. So if we all don't know what the kingdom of heaven is, I need to start over from scratch, Okay. Kingdom of heaven. Somebody just take a guess. Oh my goodness, we're in big trouble. All right, those of you that are online, can you text me what the kingdom of heaven is, all right? They're all just scared. The kingdom of heaven. Folks, this is huge. I mean, we're talking about nine out of 10 parables and 20, and, and excuse me, about 80% of the gospels are all about the kingdom of heaven. If we don't understand the kingdom of heaven, you're going you're gonna to miss everything because what we grow up believing is the kingdom of heaven is somewhere out there over the rainbow and it's got golden streets that lead to some place called the Wizard of Oz. No. The kingdom of heaven is you. And it is built inside of you. You see, the kingdom of heaven, you, you think of it, it's a kingdom. In the old days, kingdoms were real kingdoms. You had a palace or a castle. You had walls. You had all the people that were in the kingdom lived inside those walls. The bride lived inside the walls. The rest of the family lived out in the fields. And the king lived in, inside the walls as well. That is the kingdom of Camelot. Kingdom of 
wherever. The kingdom of God is where you are because he says he lives inside of you. That's why he says the kingdom is inside of you, okay? So this is important as we walk through some of these parables. The kingdom of heaven, what it's going to be like when the kingdom gets here, is like a certain king who arranged a marriage for his son. Don't think that they don't already know this story. These are Jewish people in the first century that he's talking to. And he sent out his servants to call those who were invited to the wedding. And they were not willing to come. What did the servant of, of Abraham say? What if the bride is not willing to come? And again, he sent out other servants saying, tell those who are invited, see, I have prepared my dinner. My oxen and fatted cattle are killed and all the things are ready. Come to the wedding. Instantly, you should know what time of year this is. If you know your Bible uh, calendar and you know when typically weddings were done for kings, you should instantly know when we're talking about. And the fatted calf is killed. And there's a massive feast. Huh? It's Sukkot. This is right after Rosh Hashanah. Because, you know, that, that, what they call the head of the year, but really it's Yom Terah, the blowing of the trumpets. What happens at, at Yom Terah? The Feast of Trumpets. Tishrei 1. This is when kings are inaugurated. And this is when kings are wedded. This becomes incredibly prophetic. Because right after they're wedded, what do they do? They go on vacation for a week. Seven days. What happens after that? Right after that, you have Yom Kippur and then the Feast of Tabernacles where they literally invite all of the guests and they have this massive feast. Sound familiar? When the Messiah comes back, weds his bride and he takes her out of the earth on the Feast of Trumpets and there are ten days and technically it could be as little as seven because Yom Terah could be two days going into the third. Seven to ten days he pulls us off the earth. That's what the Christian church calls the rapture. All it is is the, is the, is the calling up once we meet Messiah in the air, he destroys all of the governments. That's when he has the great wrath of God, the governments that are on the earth while he's wedding his bride in intimacy. After that is over, he comes back down, splits the Mount of Olives into two, and bingo, the Feast of Trumpets, or excuse me, the Feast of Tabernacles starts shortly thereafter where you have the marriage supper of the Lamb. Why is this getting important? Well, follow me here. And again, he sent out the servants where we have, but they made light of it. He said, come to the wedding, come to the wedding. My, my oxen and fatted cattle are killed. But they made light of it and went their ways, one to his own farm and another to his business. Did you hear what verse 4 said, by the way? It said, again, he sent out other servants saying, tell those who were invited. So the first call went out to those who were invited to the wedding, and they were not willing to come. So they sent out other servants to tell those that were invited. See, I have prepared my dinner. My oxen, my fatted cattle are killed. Who gets invited to a wedding, by the way? Don't think for a moment what you, what you learned growing up, this is not mean the whole world is invited. I'm sorry. You do not have a wedding and invite the whole world. I've been to a wedding in my own family just a couple of weeks ago. Maybe it was last week. I'm, uh, the days are blurring for my 15-hour work days. And they overbooked the, the church and the reception hall. So by the time the wedding party showed up the reception hall, they, the G DJ had to get on the, the, the microphone and ask people to get up so that the wedding party could eat. It was kind of like inviting the world. You don't do it. Who do you invite? Only two. Friends and family. Friends and family. The closest, and, and guess who gets to sit up front? Huh? 
family, friends go in the back. Show up late, you're standing in the room only. And if you show up really late, in, in, in this last wedding I went to, you were standing outside in the hall watching it on the screen. If you don't think that's a picture of exactly what's going to happen at the end time, you are very deceived. Because you're going to have some that are there early and they got the invitation and they knew to get there early. They were ready for the wedding. They were there. They got to sit up front close to the bridegroom. There are those that showed up kind of halfway through and they kind of they took it sort of seriously and they got a seat. There are those that showed up late and they're lucky to get in by the skin of their teeth. And there are those unfortunate folks that didn't take it seriously. And they're outside the camp having to watch the parade of the Messiah on Dish Network. I'm sorry it won't do it justice. You want to be in the kingdom, folks. Not just make it. It's not worth it. So let's get into the details of this. Tell those who are invited, go and come to the wedding. They made light of it. They didn't want to come to the wedding. They went and did their own thing. And the rest seized his servants, treated them spitefully, and killed them. Do you realize that this is exactly what they did to the prophets? Do you think that Yeshua is just making this up? Or do you think that this is absolutely right out of the prophets of what is going to happen at the end days? Because the two prophets come. Some say they're Moses and Elijah. I don't know. I think they're, they could be literally a re, you know, Moses and, and Elijah that, that, that come in the spirit of Moses and Elijah. It could be the two witnesses that are, that are uh, real people and also prophetic of the northern and southern kingdom, representing all of Israel. All we know is at the end of time, those two witnesses go out and say, come to the wedding. It's almost here. And what do they do? The people kill them. They treat them spitefully and kill them. But when the king heard about it, he was furious, and he sent out his armies, destroyed those murderers. What happens right after those witnesses uh, die? Three days later, they rise from the dead, but they get in big trouble for killing his, his people and burned up their city. Then he said to his servants, the wedding is ready. But those who were invited were not worthy. Therefore, go into the highways, and as many as you can find, invite to the wedding. So those servants went out into the highways and gathered together all whom they found, both bad and good. And the wedding hall was filled with who? With the guests. But when the king came in to see the guests, he saw a man there who did not have on a wedding garment. So he said to him, friend, how did you come in here without a wedding garment? And he was speechless. Then the king said to the servants, bind him hand and foot, take him away, and cast him into outer darkness. There will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. For many are called, but few are chosen. My question is, how does this guy make it into the wedding feast? And he has no garment on. No wedding garment. Why is that a big deal? The significance of the wedding garment in the first century was a big deal. It's not like today, like last weekend when I went to the wedding, I wore something like this. We don't have wedding garments anymore. It's not like it was in the old days where, how many remember when you went on an airplane, you got dressed up? Right? Don't raise your hand. I do, though. I remember people would look down on you if you got on a, on a plane with flip-flops and shorts. Are you kidding me? Today, it's, it's 50% of them are in flip-flops and shorts. There was something significant about the wedding garment. Here's why. At the base of the, of the and I'll probably close with this. At the base of the Mount, uh, of, uh, Mount Zion, there is, in the first century, a pool called the Pool of Siloam. This pool was just discovered in the last few years uh, by a friend of mine, and I got to be there and see this pool. And it was just the stairs have been excavated. And this pool is a massive size Olympic pool. On one side was stairs going down in the pool, and on the other side is stairs going up. Once you come out of the pool, you are to put on a robe. Guess what color? Very good. White. 
representing righteousness and all of the colors of the rainbow because white is a reflection of all the colors. Not just one, all of the characteristics of Yahweh. From there, you ascended the mount of the Lord. So whenever you see that in Scripture, who can ascend the hill of the Lord? That's what it's talking about. That is not just a, a clever phrase uh, that is pulled out, I believe, in the Psalms. That is right out of first century idioms. They know what that means. The hill of the Lord is to the temple. Who can climb to the hill of the Lord? He who has a clean hands and a pure heart. Why? Because he was just immersed in the water, the pure well, the pure water of the word. Unless you are immersed in the pure water of the word, and let me say it the way that they would have said it, because remember, there was no New Testament when this was all written, and there's no New Testament when it was written back in the Tanakh. Unless you have clean hands and a pure heart, and you are washed in the water of the Torah, all of it, both the spirit of Yeshua and the letter of the word, you cannot ascend to the hill of the Lord. Because when you get to the top and you walk in the doors, you will be rejected by the guardian into the holy of holies because no one ascends the hill of the Lord and stands before Yahweh without the right robe. Now you say, Jim, what are you trying to say? Are you saying hey, you got to you know, keep the Torah for salvation? No, that's not what I'm saying. What I'm saying is if you want to be the bride, the bride is taken from the rest of the family. You see, this is not just one size fits all where, you know, you accept Jesus into your heart and you, you know, you get a little oil put on your forehead or whatever and you're saved forever. And everybody gets the same and everybody gets a little track home in heaven. No. There are rewards. There is greatest in the kingdom. There is least in the kingdom. Is there not? There's bride and there's wedding guests right here. If you are a wedding guest, where were you? In this parable, where were the wedding guests? Out doing business in their farms, having their own way, doing whatever they wanted to do. What was the bride? Where was the bride? Right next to the king. And what is the king? He is the living word of God. He's the living Torah. You stay right next to the king. You do exactly what the king says and you live in his chambers. Now to some people, that's not even something they desire. Have you ever heard anybody say, man, I, I just I'd be happy to get there. Those people probably won't get there. Because that's not what it takes, is the, well, you know, I'll be happy to get there. That attitude says you are an adulterer. You have no desire to please your spouse. I'm just happy to be married. I'm just happy my wife hasn't divorced me yet. Probably a miserable marriage. I can assure you folks, and I, I, again, I, I didn't plan this message. I mean, I, so forgive me if, it, if it's coming out this way, because I think it's coming from him. He wants a pure bride. He's not looking for wedding guests this time. He's looking for a big, I shouldn't say a big bride, that doesn't work. <laughs> He's a big guy, I, I don't know. Yeah. Delete. He is looking for... No, it doesn't work either. As many brides. That doesn't work. Anyway, you know what I'm saying, okay? He wants as many of us to be part of his bride as possible. And I'll end with this. This is why, folks, during the Great Tribulation in ancient Israel, in Israel today, there are three harvest. There's the first harvest, the Feast of Shavuot. That's the, that is the barley harvest. It's representative of those that will be taken away and protected, the bride, during the Great Tribulation, taken into the wilderness and protected, while the rest, the, the rest of the family is on their own. 
as the family goes and goes through the great tribulation. I didn't say she was, I didn't say she was resurrected. I said she was taken away into the wilderness and protected. But the rest of the family will be taken up in the wheat harvest, which is the, at Yom Terah, the Feast of Trumpets. That is the second harvest in ancient Israel. And in Israel today is the wheat harvest. Those two harvests are the grain harvest. Remember when Yeshua was walking through the, the wheat field? A field represents people. When the harvest is completely full, it's the only two harvests that have to do with grain. Those are the two harvests. All of his people then are, are resurrected at Yom Terah. And there's one left. It's called the wine press. It's called the, the, the fruit of the trees. It's the wine, great wine press, and it's not the one that you want to be in. That's the one that the grapes are destroyed and the blood flows. Yahweh is looking for a bride that is spotless. Not perfect, by the way. You know, when it says, and, and I got challenged on this, this last week, it says that, that Noah was perfect. In the eyes of God. It didn't mean it didn't say sinless. It said complete in Hebrew. It means complete. It means his heart was dedicated and completely dedicated. Can I ask you a question tonight? Is your heart 100% completely dedicated? What are you holding back? You're only shortchanging your eternity. I can promise you one thing. When we get there and we are in Jerusalem, you will remember 70 short years wasted for eternity. There's no going back. There's no second chances. There's no way for you to do the right thing ever again. No way. There's no get out of jail car. There's no second chance. It's over. And to have the attitude, I just hope I get there. Or I'm, I'll, be, I'll take least in the kingdom. Are you sure? It's eternity. Eternity. You know how long eternity is? Picture for me the entire earth made out of sand. And every one million years, a bird comes from outer space somewhere and takes away one grain of sand. Every one million years. When the entire earth is gone because of this bird, every million years taking one grain of sand, that's one second of eternity. I am begging you and pleading, and I'm talking to myself. Are you sure you're 100% dedicated to your spouse? Father, I just come before you today broken, humbled by this, this message. There are still areas in my own life that need to be dedicated, laid down, surrendered. You hit it right on the head when you said that we are a stubborn, stiff-necked people who cannot make up their mind whether to serve you or not. You have watched your people for 6,000 years waver. Love you, hate you. Love you, commit adultery. We have hoard among the nations, Father, all these years. We cannot make up our mind. We wander in the desert. We are so much like our predecessors, it's not even funny. After you give us breath, clothes on our back, a place to lie our head, wonderful spouses, beautiful children, great friends. It's not too hot. It's not too cold. You've given us a planet that is so just utterly paradise. And if that wasn't enough, you sent your only begotten son to die for us, to pay what we could not pay. And we spit in your face and say it's not good enough for us to give our life 
without dying. You give us the ability and talent to have jobs and we spend all the money on ourselves. We cannot stop and ask a homeless person if they need help. Father, we're the ones that are homeless and we don't even know it. Your people still wander in the desert. I pray that you would call us back home. Raise up an army, Father. The Canaanites are strong. The enemy is waiting. He is not of this world. And he fights with weapons that cannot compare to our fleshly desires. We can only wage war in the spiritual realm. So I pray you cause your, your people to be spiritual. Cause us to fall on our knees and to repent. Matt, can you come up for a second? Father, I ask that you would bring Teshuvah into your people. Help us to turn from our sins. And if for, if for anything else, that we would just ratchet it up one more. Time is getting short. The hourglass is getting low. Breathe life into your people. Father, for all those that are online right now, Father, if this is someone's first time in hearing anything like this, I pray that you would spark a fire in their spirit for your word to such a degree that they will never be able to turn around ever again and never be satisfied with milk, ever. Draw the fire inside of every one of us. Whatever it takes, Father, take us where we need to be. I don't care what it costs me personally. I will give everything I have just to be fully dedicated and know that I'm pleasing you. I want to be in your chamber. I'm a broken man that has a lot of hang-ups. And I'm sure everyone in this room can relate. forgive us of our sins and our iniquity and Father forgive us for just the lack of desire to serve you. Unencumbered all in fourth quarter fourth and one. Don't let us quit. Father for those that aren't serious that have chosen to play the game but they still love you. Call them across the line. Let them truly cross over. The word Hebrew means cross over. Let them be fully Hebrew. Not a Canaanite and a Hebrew. Make us all fully cross over. The enemy's right behind us. If we do not cross the Red Sea now, we will be destroyed by the Canaanites. Today is the day of salvation in every way. Make it that way in our lives. For our loved ones, that Lord, that don't know you or understand your word, I pray that you would open their eyes and bring such a revival to this land and to these families that all the peoples of the earth would look in our families, in our subdivisions, in our communities, in our regions, and they would go, what is going on? I've not seen life like this. Bring a well of water coming up from inside of us. Let it overflow. Break our stiff necks if that's what it takes and give us a heart of flesh. We give you back our heart of stone. We don't want it. Father, we, we are small. We are just a, a few people with the desire to change all of St. Louis County and to reach the world for this message that you've given us. How can we do so if you do not trumpet through us? If you do not provide and open the doors, and how can you do that? And would you do that if we're not even ready or prepared to be priests at your table? Let us cast off that which besets us. And let us run this race to win. No more jogging. No more walking around the track. It is time to win. And to run as if that is our desire and goal. The most miserable place a believer could ever be is lukewarm. I have lukewarm areas in my life, Father. Burn them out of me. 
I want to serve you and run without a limp. I give you all the praise and the glory, Father. I didn't intend this message tonight, and I didn't intend to feel as convicted as I am already right now. I thank you. tempted to ask if you're serious to stand, but I'm not going to do any of that. Because I don't care if you stand. It doesn't matter if you stand. How many times have we stood for God and sat right back down as soon as the service is over? I'm going to ask you to do one thing. With every head bowed and eyes closed, I'm going to ask you to do this. If you are absolutely serious about taking God serious, the call on your life, the call on your marriage, ratcheting it up in every way that you can imagine. Do it. Be real. Life is short. Grab the hand of your neighbor and say, you're coming with me. If you're online and you have loved ones, pay their way to come to the conference. Do something that you would never do. Go beyond, be stretched. Be crazy. Give an entire week's paycheck to the poor. Do something that is beyond your imagination and comfort zone. Get serious. Time is short. He's looking for a bride that is a player and a warrior. Father, forgive us, for we know not what we do. Make your bride holy and set apart because you gave your life to set us apart. How dare we take the fine china and put dog food in it? You gave us life. Don't let us throw it away. You are good, and you are holy, and we do not deserve to be even invited to the wedding, but we say thank you for inviting us to the wedding. I pray that one person online or here tonight, just maybe one person, would be so challenged tonight by your message, they would forever be changed, never to return to their sin, their vomit, or their complacency. Let compromise never be part of our vocabulary. Thank you, Yahweh, for you are good. For you are good. You are good to me. Sing it with me.
Come on up for a second. sing this last song together, shall we? Or just the chorus. Yahweh, fill my place. Fill this place. Let your spirit reside in your temple. Father, you have chosen to live in us. How can we not give you a place? of shalom, of purity, of holiness. 
if we are set apart, how much more you fill this place. Let this night be cast into our minds as the night that we vowed to be your bride. We are honored at the invitation, humbled in every way. We say,